This means that the atmosphere could not have been oxidizing beyond this point. Thus, Precambrian life could only have lived on anaerobic respiration and photosynthesis. Aerobic respiration requires oxygen. Now, the process of photosynthesis takes in carbon dioxide and water and produces glucose and oxygen. Anaerobic takes in glucose, lets out lactic acid, or ethanol. Tasty, tasty ethanol. So essentially, the two processes combined turn carbon dioxide into oxygen, as well as a few other organic molecules. Plenty of organisms still use either process. The driving force of the Cambrian explosion was a simple, small step. It's the ability to use oxygen. Comparing anaerobic respiration with aerobic respiration. One releases 2 ATP, the other 36. Energy increases 18-fold. Now, I realize that modern respiration is complicated. Likely, the first creature to use it only performed the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle produces NADH and FADH2, which can be used to generate ATP with an ATP synthase enzyme. These products are spread out through several steps of the cycle, so it's perfectly plausible that the citric acid cycle evolved step by step. Each step generates a little product. ATP synthase was already used in the process of photosynthesis, and the electron transport chain likely evolved step by step to make use of the extra NADH and FADH2. From there, with a tremendous amount of energy, it would be able to build things that it couldn't before. Because of lack of competition, these creatures would rapidly proliferate until they began competing with one another. Once that happened, selective pressure and the increase in energy provided by respiration would drive a veritable explosion of diversity. Thus, the combination of the geologic record and evolution actually predict the fossil record of the Cambrian explosion. So to make a long story short, Sternberg was fired because he published a paper founded on ignorance, violated the peer review process, lied about it, all to further a campaign founded in religion. For your ignorance, academic dishonesty, and defamation by falsely accusing the Smithsonian of discriminating against your religion, Mr. Sternberg, you fail. Please turn in your doctorates on the way out. But surely it was just an isolated case. I was still pretty skeptical, so naturally I checked in with the head of the Skeptic Society, Michael Shermer. So I can't prove there is no God or Yahweh in your case any more than I can prove there is no Isis, Zeus, Apollo, Brahma, Ganesha, Mithras, Allah, or for that matter the flying spaghetti monster. And, and think about just one thing. Why would the aliens look like this? Well, that's, these, these are who bipedal, drew that? Who drew that? They, skepticism uh, it's not a position you take, it's just an approach to claims. So this one is called the borderlands of science, yeah. where sense meets nonsense. Is intelligent design nonsense? Well, it's unproven, so in that sense it's nonsense. So I would put it in the, in the sort of shaded areas between good solid science and total nonsense. You know, it's sort of three quarters of the way toward the nonsense side. But you think, and nevertheless, people should be allowed to speak about and publish papers about it? They are free to write and publish and be heard in public forums and go to conferences just like everybody else does. Well, what if a person published something, say, at the Smithsonian, uh, in favor of intelligent design and then lost his job over it? And it had been peer-reviewed, it had been peer-reviewed and published, and then he lost his job over it anyway. What would happen? What do you well, think about that situation? I think that particular situation, there was something else. Going. Like misrepresenting a fundamentally flawed hypothesis as good science, lying about its support in the scientific community, all to advance creation science. After Dr. Caroline Crocker simply mentioned intelligent design in her cell biology class at George Mason University, her promising academic career came to an abrupt end. My supervisor invited me into his office. He said, I'm going to have to discipline you for teaching creationism. And I said, I mentioned intelligent design on a couple of slides, but I did not teach creationism. He said, nonetheless, you have to be disciplined. At the end of the semester, I lost my job. Poor baby. Firstly, by mentioned ID on a couple of slides, she means that she spent a good chunk of the course telling the class that evolution was wrong, then giving them a couple of slides on ID, saying that that was right, and moving on. Secondly, by lost her job, she means that she was on a non-tenure track and her contract ended at the end of the year and her boss simply opted not to renew her. Not only did this well-loved professor lose her job at George Mason, she suddenly found herself blacklisted 
unable to find a job anywhere. So whenever I interviewed for a job, I would be offered it usually on the spot. Since this has happened and since people can Google my name, I'm finding that when I send my credentials, I do get interviews, I get many interviews, but I never get offered a job. Yes, teaching intelligent design as a more valid theory than evolution is until you produce some evidence not constitutional. Colleges are businesses too, they provide education in exchange for money. If they were to hire a teacher who taught creationism, not only would they be guilty of fraud for not providing the education they're supposed to, but the scandal of it would drive even more students away, resulting in loss of money. In other words, to them, hiring you would be unethical to the students and a loss of money. For your misrepresentation of science to paying students, whether it is due to dishonesty or incompetence, Mrs. Crocker, I'm afraid you fail. If you still have trouble finding a job, perhaps teaching isn't your forte. When all else fails, there's still McDonald's. There's nothing to be learned in neurosurgery by assuming a, a, an accidental origin for the, the parts of the brain that we work on. It wasn't just biologists who were feeling the Darwinist wrath. When neurosurgeon Michael Egnor wrote an essay to high school students saying doctors didn't need to study evolution in order to practice medicine, the Darwinists were quick to try and exterminate this new threat. And rightfully so. Without homologous structures, the animal testing that makes medicine safe would be invalid. Granted, if someone studies exactly how the brain works, gets lots of practice, and is employed only for surgical operations, it's possible for him to do a decent job without knowing anything about evolution. You know, much like you can have a robotic arm assemble car parts without it knowing how cars work. However, doctors can avoid learning evolution and practice medicine? What about genetic disorders? What about AIDS? What about cancer? Cancer? What about diabetes? It seems to me as though the good doctor would be content to return to the Dark Ages where epilepsy was treated with a hole in the head and the deadliest of plagues was combated by strapping a chicken with a shaved ass to the swollen spots. I am so not kidding! According to the Hippocratic Oath, in order to become a doctor, you must first do no harm. It is my contention that return to medieval times would be harmful indeed, and so, sir, I hold you in violation of your sworn oath. You fail. Please turn in your doctor. I'm an old guy. I have uh, tenure. I'm academically safe. But the young people and what, what is happening to them in America right now because of this scientism gulag is, uh, is really terrible. Apparently, Professor Marx was not as safe as he thought. A few months after this interview, Baylor University shut down his research website and forced him to return grant money once they discovered a link between his work and intelligent design. Actually, they were willing to allow the website as long as you let people know that it didn't represent the opinion of the school. A one-paragraph disclaimer. That's all it needed. I suppose, though, the attention drawn by martyrdom considerably exceeds the value of the website. As for grants, well, they did reject a $30,000 grant to have Bill Dembski's name attached to the site. Technically, it wasn't one of Baylor's grants. The funding was likely canceled because Baylor removed the website, which wouldn't have happened if that paragraph were added. Astronomer Guillermo Gonzalez found himself in a fierce shootout with Iowa State University following the publication of his book, arguing that the universe is intelligently designed. Despite a stellar research record that has led to the discovery of several planets, his application for tenure was denied. Stellar how? He published little to no peer-reviewed work, he brought the school very few grants, and only once in his career did a student finish a dissertation. On average, physicists, astronomers, astrophysicists, and the like obtain over a million dollars in grants. He obtained about 20000 He falls short by nearly two orders of magnitude. I'd also like to note that having skimmed the extrasolar planets, none of their discoveries seem to be credited to him. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It seems that there may have been some confusion. He did do some research on new yet already discovered planets as well as their parent stars. 
He concluded that stars with more giant planets tend to be more metallic. This is interesting and is predicted by a current knowledge of planet formation. Essentially, the non-hydrogen elements are split in a proportion between the sun and its planets. More and bigger planets equals...